Anyway, this is uh, Brian McDonald, um, Chaucy to you folks out there, but I thought you'd just like to meet Chaucy. Um, wind beneath their wings. Uh, uh, he does so much around here to make this. Wouldn't be possible without these guys doing this off the side of the desk. It's not in the job description. So I thought we'd all just like to say hello to Chaucy for a few minutes. And uh, it was Jerry Kelly said, one of our first uh, uh, presidents of this institution, said that the uh, faculty were quite like uh, uh, what's that John Cruise, uh, uh, Tom Cruise's movie, uh, Top Guns, that we were sort of the pilots in flying, but we couldn't stay in the air without Brian and folks in the program office and folks like that below that keep, keep us flying. And so I want to thank you for doing this for us and much, much appreciate it. Yeah, no good, problem. Good man, good man. Yeah. Thanks, Brian, very much. Well, you met Chassie, uh, does so much around here for us. Just wanted to introduce him to you. Well, this is our last session, mixed feelings, of course, as we wrap it all up, but I'm sure you have the same sort of things, happy to be through it. Um, but having said that, uh, this is uh, session eight, it's the waterfall method. I try to wrap up the course here for you. Uh, it's the process that I use in crafting strategy, uh, but understand strategy is not linear, even though the waterfall method kind of suggests it is. Uh, if you've got an existing one, you're zooming in and out all the time, tweaking and adjusting based on what's happening with the water in the bathtub. But if you've got a blank piece of paper, uh, I commend uh, the waterfall method as one process that you might follow. We start that process with the three C's, that little video clip, that we talk in terms of the company, the competitors, and our customers, and populate those, those three spheres with all the data, modeling, information you can find. Get all the data in there and dump it on the table, trying to identify clearly that little A sweet spot that is going to be your area, your terrain that you're going to defend. And, uh, and based on that, you'll write your vision, your mission, and focus on that little square as we do it. Um, I also sent you out a template, a strategic uh, um, business plan, template, marketing plan. It, it suits a number of purposes. You just have to go through the different headings in there, select the ones that are appropriate to you. And in each of those headings, I have given some suggested tools from the Little Red Toolbox that you might consider using to uh, support that particular uh, entry part in, into, into, your, into your plan. Um, your papers, uh, I'll have them back to you by Friday, hopefully a little sooner. Uh, feedback is certainly there. I'm very pleased with the grades coming out. Uh, everybody's doing well at this stage. Uh, I still have quite a way to go, but uh, uh, having said that, the uh, you'll find that the feedback I forget how many pages I've got. I think it's about 20 pages of feedback for each of you. A lot of it is boilerplate, but I wonder if you'd have the full Monty uh, to see all these things spelled out, what you could do as a consultant if you're doing this or if you have your OMP, both the template and this uh, full feedback on a case study will give you a sense of what you could write up as a consultant in OMPs or working for, uh, actually getting paid for a living doing this sort of work. The exam, of course, is a closed book. As I said, uh, the time you open this on Monday, um, I will send you the actual case that you'll be getting on the exam. that will give you the balance of week eight and those days leading up to the exam the following week to sit with your colleagues, kick it around, identify what the cases happen to be, uh, the questions might be. And then when you go into the exam, the purpose is um, just to bring the stress level down. You still have to work hard and demonstrate to me you understand the concepts and notions, but uh, uh, some people write exams well, other people get quite, quite tense about it, so I don't want to uh, put undue pressure on if I don't have to. Well, folks, with that, I've uh, used uh, the last little session's work, but it saves me repeating it. Um, but now we're, we have that uh, uh, the waterfall method, the three C's, the sweet spot. And I want you to try something. I sent out to you the, the, the Blue Ocean strategy and how to perform one of those. Later on today, as part of my closing shot as we finish up the series, I will uh, talk a bit about Blue Ocean application and give you another example of what you would do as well when you do that waterfall and apply the template and get all the data dumped on the table in identifying that sweet spot. And before you craft your strategy, is there a blue ocean strategy for you rather than fight in a fierce red ocean? And so I want you to consider that as you uh, back within your organizations as well as you do it. Well, very quickly then today, through Bloomberg, just a couple of highlights, some things. Um, interesting, since uh, um, 2000 and, uh, 2001, um, correction, 2016, 2016, uh, the uh, Saudi's oil supply has gone from uh, 2 million barrels in uh, 1965 up to 12.3 million barrels in 2016. So uh, 
that's quite an increase in the amount of oil that they're producing. And I'll talk today a bit about the oil sands and their projections of what they're going to produce. So it's an interesting number as we talk about demand and supply curves for, for the oil industry. Uh, article in here on China and the Bing Bang, Bing Bang Theory. Um, they make reference to Margaret Thatcher, who in 1979 uh, took us on this trip down for globalization. And at the time she stepped into power, the city of London, they say, was a relatively insular, bowler-hatted affair. Exchange controls were in place. The city had freewheeling parts, such as the euro market. But the stock market was covered up by British brokers and jobbers uh, with Horgwathian names, such as Ackroyd and Smythe. Um, Big Bang swept away these rules and let foreigners to come on in and create a modern cosmopolitan London that was about to rival uh, uh, New York until Brexit took place. And so now it's a little question about that to what the future of the exchange will be in London. But they're saying China's in a different position, but just about doing the same thing. You recall it's the second largest economy, and purchasing power parity, it's the largest economy, and it'll be three times the American economy in, uh, by 2050, according to projections. Uh, but it's trying to get its financial systems in place, and it's doing it slowly. It's not trying to do a big bang that they're talking about, but it is trying to reset uh, its financial affairs on licensing and bureaucracy and how to do it. And Thatcher's reforms were ideology, a right wing, uh, uh, same thing we see today with Trump and uh, Reagan at that time. Um, China is driven by Western educated technocrats um, based on MBAs from, from Harvard and places like that are looking at it. And so what you have is uh, they're referring to as a second revolution. The first revolution was uh, in 1966 with Chairman Mao, the Cultural Revolution, where they took all the uh, educated folks and things like that and put them out in the farms and uh, all the debates were one, there was only one source for informa information. That was the Little Red Book. In fact, I've got three of them at home. Uh, the Little Red Book that you had to rely upon and evidence-based, that would be your citation to, uh, to do it. And so... Uh, it's all consistent what we talked about about China is re-emerging, re-establishing itself as the uh, as the Middle Kingdom, and they're resetting their financial rules in place to uh, rival the global uh, centers. Um, Tesla, I read some more articles about Tesla and what it's doing, and I think all of us have talked a bit about that already on the course. But it's an interesting uh, case study for us to watch as a. Uh, it's a blue ocean company. It's a found sort of a new area to play in. Competition hasn't been fierce. It's jumped in there. The rules don't apply. But uh, you still think some rules have to apply as they do it. And in military terms, you might do the analogy of running out of the supply chain. Uh, that uh, the Battle of the Bulge, the Germans gave it one last kick about 1944, came running through the, uh, uh, through the uh, Ardennes, that area crashing through. And uh, they had to make it so far in order to pick up uh, the Americans and the uh, Allies' oil supplies, or else it would run out of, uh, out of fuel stock because they didn't have the infrastructure to run alongside. And the same thing's happening here with uh, with Musk. He's running down. He's out in front, but the uh, he, he's got the strategy in place, the bluish strategy in place. But it seems to me that he's running out. And, and what's coming up for him is a 1.2 billion dollar convertible debt debenture that has to be retired in the next 12 months. And the price of the common shares. It's unlikely people are going to convert their bonds to shares uh, because the shares are too too low in value at this present time to do that. And so he's going to have to raise $1.2 billion further in his cash. And uh, some of the investors are getting twitchy about putting deposits down and not getting them. So there's a bit of a cash crunch coming up ahead for Tesla. We should watch on the horizon as we do it. But it's interesting. Uh, uh, he's a CEO. He's like a commander-in-chief. He's gone down to the front lines. He's, he's sleeping and working at the site of the Tesla plant building these cars, trying to get up to those production levels that he needs to get to. And so he's doing management by walkabout, all those things we teach in the course. He's doing it, and he's leading by example. He's right down there in the front. But I think it speaks to, and I think hopefully we're, we're wrong in this, but I think it speaks to the anybody can craft a strategy. The problem is execution. And it's the execution portion of this that seems to be falling apart. He's got the strategy, the blue ocean, but I'm not sure he's got the execution abilities to put it in place. I think he needs a few of you folks to join him. Um, Bitcoins was an interesting story here about the future of Bitcoins and what's a Bitcoin truly worth these days? Uh, we do it and so they go through a bit of a story here about uh, anywhere from zero to a million dollars they've got estimates from. But they took a, uh, a professor emeritus from the London School of Economics and somebody else and they went for lunch one night and uh, for dinner one evening and uh, on the tabletop uh, scratched some numbers applying some well-known uh, um, formulas to come up with a value and uh, uh, one of the ones which is uh, uh, a very basic Irving fishing model that came out prior to World War II, 
Irving Fisher model, we talk about in international business a lot, um, you simply take the, the money supply, the economists will tell you at the different levels of money supply, how much base in, down the basement money is being printed, you take the money supply, what's available, you take the rate at which each patient, each person uses that coin, cashes it, the dollar exchanges hands, which is the velocity, the rate of exchange, the rate, rate that you'd use it, and here they say it would be usable four times, and then you take the, the capitalization, uh, to the total what it comes to, and divide that number into it, and it gives you a, a value. And so in this case, they, they came to the conclusion that uh, uh, there's roughly uh, the supply of coins, is about 15 million bitcoins currently in existence, there may be a little bit more, uh, he said the average person would exchange these bitcoins no more than four times a year, unlike our currency, in and out of your pocket fast, four times a year. And he said uh, the capitalization that there's about $1.2 billion worth of, based on the current value that you can expend. But if you take that four times the 15 billion units, the actual uh, bitcoin numbers, you get that there's 60 million bitcoin payments possible. And you divide the 60 into the 1.2 uh, billion, and you come up with a value of about $20, billion, uh, 20, million, uh, $20. Um, and there's other credentials that come up to say uh, the IMF says it's probably worth about $60, uh, $600, and uh, others say zero, and uh, our friend Maccabee has said it's worth a million dollars. So it's all over the map, but it was an interesting little exercise. But it based very much the Bitcoin, uh, it, it doesn't have any, any, any uh, intrinsic value. It's a fiat currency, uh, fiat, it, it's, uh, it's uh, just a coin. Um, and so uh, it's fun to watch that as we go through it. Um, next, we had, uh, no, not Cuba. I don't want to talk about Cuba. Of course, Cuba's changed hands. Um, kind of bear with me for a few seconds. I'm pretty fingers. Oh, Iran, banking mess, yeah. Big article on Iran in here, and that's timely with what I'll talk about in a few minutes about the, uh, the Iran deal going, uh, being withdrawn by, by Trump. Uh, this is Wednesday today. There'll be lots more said over the next couple of days on it, uh, being said, but uh, um, this gives an insight into the uh, infrastructure and the precarious position that the uh, financial infrastructure in Iran is in, and talking about that right now it's impossible to get a bank loan. Uh, you can put your money into the banks, but if you go to the bank, even though you've got all the cash in the bank and want to borrow, uh, it's very difficult to get your money back because they've put it into buildings and things like that, but they don't put a lot of loans out, which is slowing down business and the economy because if you can't get capital to run your business, then of course you're out of business. And so they say that's the biggest threat, uh, uh, even bigger than Donald Trump's ripping up the agreement. Um, inflation right now is about 9.6% over there, and unemployment is extremely high. So just touch base on that, I thought it was an interesting little sidebar. Um, and the final little thing I had here was a great story here, here about the American dream, and they talk about folks in uh, Silicon Valley, but increasing numbers, uh, they're coming to Canada. Um, the highly prized tech workers are ditching their visas and moving north to uh, work in Canada at uh, our centers just because of the quality of life and, uh, and uh, a little bit more of the Canadian culture. So interesting stuff in there to, to look at. Foreign affairs, I'll hold on a minute and run through the paper quickly if I can. I smiled at this. Uh, RCMP break into a home and they're rummaging through the, the bedroom and other places <laughs> and the little boy pipes up, mummy makes false money. And uh, with that, the RCMP look at it and find uh, about $61,000 in counterfeit Canadian bills and $3,600 in U.S. bills. And she's arrested for 27 charges of, uh, of uh, uh, counterfeit passing. Uh, so uh, my only question there was, did he get a finder's fee that he put in a trust account? Because mummy's going to jail. Um, Iran pulls out, yeah, the, today this idea of Trump, we talked about the Iran deal, we just shut it for a few minutes about. Um, and it, it's interesting there, so you, you've got, if you did a stakeholder analysis on that situation and did the players, on one cluster you've got the Europeans led by Macron, who's, who really starting to take the pole position away from, uh, my opinion, away from uh, German Merkel at this point and leading the way. And the two of them bonded so nicely when they came to, to Washington, uh, unlike uh, the one, those that followed, uh, May phoned in, um, Merkel came and uh, the relationship's not as strong as it's evident with Merkel and, and Trump. And so they seem to be bonding a bit. But having said that, you've got the, the Europeans over here, and particularly Germany, it's got five, million, five billion dollars of its uh, GMP is based on business in Iran. And so it's an economic consideration for them when they're told to tighten down and, and to cut the strings and one thing or another. And the other cluster of stakeholders are the, uh, are the Arabs, the Saudis and uh, Israelis and these folks through here. It's not so much about 
the economy, rather it's about their national security. And so Trump has to try to balance when he makes this decision using a stakeholder analysis, what's the strategy for each group to walk through this uh, tunnel he finds himself in? So that was an interesting thought, applying our stuff we talk about. Victoria is eyeing new standards for apartments. Uh, um, we got the very low vacancy rate here, 0 0.4%, um, less than 1%, and they're putting new uh, bylaws in place for landlords to increase the dollars they spend on the facilities to include, instead of two months, three months notice for those that have to go if they're doing a change. So just another uh, squeeze for people who own properties. Um, BC is going to put uh, 25 schools and get $100,000 for uh, playgrounds. And not against playgrounds, and certainly the playgrounds are nice, but keep this as at a time when uh, we're spending other people's money. There was a time in our country that I can recall when certain community clubs, like the Rotary Club and the Kinsman Club, took great pride and a sense of purpose in supplying the Kinsman playground and things of this nature and put their signs up and the Rotary Club um, got the vehicles together for the hospitals and put their logo on the side as a courtesy van for the handicapped driving around. Um, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, I was on the board for a number of years, uh, one of the churches and it was run by nuns and by the church and it was a very efficient, very clean uh, hospital uh, and it's all been taken over by the state and so it just I'm certainly not against playgrounds, but at a time we're spending other people's money and spending children's money, it's, it's that Thatcherism that we're going to soon run out of other people's money to do this with. This, I smiled at this story this morning. I don't know how many of you heard of this before, but there's a consent captain, a consent captain, and they're hired to avoid sexual harassment. And so City of Victoria, keep in mind City of Victoria, who we just talked about, um, uh, they've got a place, a Victoria sexual health educator and intimacy coach. And she's now working for a nonprofit organization, which is funded by the city. And if you're having holding a party, a, 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 some sort of a dance or get the group social, whatever, you can hire this folks to come out and uh, her job is to go around and introduce herself at the party and uh, explain about the issue of consent. And uh, she got a tagline, Consent Matters. And uh, yeah, so uh, now dancers, you can have a consent cap and come uh, explain the, the rules of the game to you. Um, great picture here of the mayor of Victoria, and you've heard me talk about this, the, um, the bike lanes and the Blue Bridge, railway runs from 68 million up to 110 million dollars. Uh, one new Olympic swim pool, going to suppose a 2% tax on the houses in, in Victoria to help pay for this uh, downloading of the medical insurance plan. Um, the GBRD, which is part of the team, they're just uh, having the meeting and proposing a 14% increase in their annual salaries that currently run from 100000 to about a quarter of a million. They want a 14% increase at a time when uh, seniors and pensioners and things are losing their houses because they can't keep up with the taxes. Oh, they're good about that. It allows you to defer them, of course, until you die. But uh, anyway, it, 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 it's a great idea. The picture itself is a wonderful electric car put out by... Uh, it's solo three-wheel electric car unveiled by Doubletree Hilton Hotel in downtown Victoria. I think it's a fantastic idea. Again, it's something new. It's a one-seater electric car, 160-kilometer range. Uh, they give it sort of as a, uh, uh, a courtesy to guests for $20, $30 for the evening. It's a single-seater, and you can zoom around your little electric car in downtown Victoria seeing the sights or doing your business meeting, whatever you have to do. The concept is excellent. I, I liked it very, very much. But the brand, we talk about celebrity branding to have put a picture of her behind the wheel. It may work for somebody, it didn't work for me. And so it, uh, you have to be careful in your celebrity brand to you pick the right celebrity to advertise your, a very good idea. Um, WestJet's profitability streak threatened, and we've talked about WestJet here, we talked about the price of oil, and we said the impact that would be, 25% of their uh, bottom line is, is, uh, is driven by the price of oil, and oil is just banged on $70 the other day, and it will until this Iran thing in the world temperature cools down a little bit. Um, but uh, that and the potential labor strike that they're having, uh, we knew about all this, we've talked about it in class, and uh, yesterday the, uh, the stock market crashed 10%, um, based on those two, two matters. So again, if we do what we're doing in this class, if you read the front page, read the business section, reflect on it for a few moments, all of you could have made a dollar the other day by shorting WestJet stock, uh, knowing that their annual statements were coming out, and. Uh, they were going to lose some money and continue with the price of oil steps up. It's going to be the same thing three months from now. So we could look a little bit at that. They certainly have a, a difficulty doing this, uh, trying to stay out in front of it. Um, WestJet uh, 
they had to adjust their prices three times so far this year to uh, uh, to accommodate the actual fuel tax, uh, fuel charges for flights back and forth. And we're hitting that saturation point, that that price elasticity that, that uh, consumers don't want to pay anymore for flying. We're hitting that, so they, they're running out of scope on how much they can raise their, their... So it's a tough position they're in to have a look at that. Um, our Federal Natural Resources Minister, Jim Carr, uh, in question period is talking about the deal with the pipeline and keep in mind this Kinder Morgan pipeline we talked about from the landlock oil in in, in Alberta is trying desperately to get to the coast um, 31st May is a deadline for Kinder Morgan saying you tell me how you're going to do it or we're out of here we're going to leave the area and so uh, he's responding saying no problem they continue to dither um, and he said uh, the government has a world-class response plan uh, balancing the needs of the environment and the economy hasn't shared what that plan is yet, but there's not too many days left for him to, to share it. I'm reminded when st statements like that, I've got a complete collection of World War II uh, magazines for every month, for every year of the war, talking about some of the newspaper clippings and some of the stories and the battles and things. And one of the things in there I was tucked by was uh, Churchill giving a report to a, to a uh, reporter in 1942 when Britain was really in the dark, dark doldrums just before the uh, things started to brighten up a little bit. They had a plane catcher uh, very hush-hush, couldn't talk about it, but the article was actually there, and I smiled at the time, and so I chuckled when I saw this about a world-class response plan balancing the need. I'm anxious to see what it is. What will help bring it to a head is the First Nations in this province have put a small, high-power team of their leaders, and they're flying down to the Kinder Morgan Annual Shareholders Meeting, and they're going to speak down there and explain the ecosystem of BC and the delicacy and one thing or another. And of course, when you go directly to the shareholders and you rile them up and win their hearts and minds, they can put a lot of moral pressure onto the uh, directing minds of the company. So uh, there's lots of things at play here as it, uh, as it unfolds. Um, good. Vancouver-based store is gonna be sold. It went for, uh, in Vancouver, $675 million for the uh, for the retail outlet, the Bay Store, down, downtown Vancouver, it's very expensive land. Um, but uh, keep in mind, when you buy built buy companies, you can either buy the assets or buy the company, uh, buy the assets or buy the shares. And in this case, uh, like we had Toys R Us last week, they talked about buying the shares because they had a good property portfolio that they wanted to uh, either sell or leave or, or, or hive off. And so sometimes there's more money in a breakup than there is in running the company. And so uh, $675 million for a building is a nice, a nice piece of cash. The oil sands, uh, talking about caps and emissions and one thing or another, but it's uh, coupled with the, uh, what caught my eye in the, in the Bloomberg news about the rise in production of oil in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia is the productions here. Uh, in, in 2017, um, they hope to get 3.2 million barrels. Um, by 2020, 4.9. And they're saying by, uh, by uh, 2030, they expect to be up to uh, 4.76. Uh, million barrels of oil coming out. So there's a lots of supply of oil, I guess the point I'm making. At the same time, we see alternative energies um, uh, coming into this thing, of fission, one thing or another, uh, uh, coming into the system. Uh, Kennedy, uh, Albert Kenny, is uh, taking up the territory fight on carbon tax in Alberta. Um, they're having financial stress, big debt deficits, one thing or another, but yet their this car federal carbon tax is uh, going to raise from ten dollars a ton, uh, drive it up to fifty dollars a ton by 2025, by 2022, and this additional they're trying to argue it shouldn't happen. In BC, we seem to be going ahead with it, but we've made the point here that when you add this additional tax, it's going to flow through to you and I and the price of our gas and one thing or another. And uh, at the same time, uh, natural gas uh, comes from Mexico. They're not a subscriber to this, so they can send us up their natural gas and like a commodity, sugar is sugar, I'll buy my Mexican gas if I can get it cheaper than Canadian gas. And so we have to look hard at this. So he's a conservative right wing until the Hun, and he's uh, questioning all that. Um, red tape threatening the Arctic satellite industry. This is another just uh, that speaks to Canada. Um, the federal bureaucracy is going to delay the northern million dollars of investment in the high-tech industry. A Norwegian company came in there, and since 2016, they've been waiting to get the approval for an operating license. They have it all built. They need an operating license to get going in Inuvik. And it, it doesn't sound like much to us down here, $50 million, but that's a big expenditure in Inuvik. 
and they're waiting for it to happen. They're part of the European Space Agency, and we're an associate member of the European Space Agency. And so it's all been approved, it's on the up and up, and they've got the security systems in place. But they're bound by a McGill Institute air and space law, um, that legislation written when only the government launched satellites, and that's all they're going by now. It's about uh, 50 years old law, um, and they're trying to guide the approval by this piece of paper. And so the regs haven't caught up with the reality of the world. And so uh, the uh, CEO was shaking his head over there saying, just kind of under, he said, we underestimated the Canadian bureaucracy. And red tape is interesting. You might wonder where the term red tape came from. And uh, in the old days, in the barristers in England and government records, um, they were all sealed in file folders and wrapped with a red tape and filed away. And so there was just festoon with red tapes and so whenever you wanted to get a file open you called it cutting the red tape to get into the file to see what was going on and so he's saying please cut the red tape and speed up the process here in Canada because without that uh, we'll keep losing. Um, Nestle's and Starbucks are doing a seven billion dollar grocery deal in essence Nestle is buying a brand recognition by buying uh, some parts of Starbucks the right to do the use their, their brand name and some of their products. As a strategy it works the Hezbollah is gaining uh, an election, a uh, democratic election, well done, in Lebanon. Uh, Iranian-backed Hezbollah has done extremely well and uh, uh, major gains in the parliamentary elections. And uh, the uh, prime minister, um, they lost a third of their seats, so it's quite, quite a concern. But it reflects democracy is alive and well in Lebanon, but it also reflects that what you have now are wolves. You have the Hezbollah coming up on Israel's border, and you have the Syrians, the, uh, the Iranian... Uh, um, troops coming up and setting up over here, threats of setting up over here right on their border, and Israel won't stand for it, and so it's closing in. So watch for the uh, Lebanon and Syria and the ringing by Iran, and all this is going on. Oliver North was uh, named the NRA president. I love Oliver North. I mean, I just a superman, a soldier, soldier. And I remember when I watched the, uh, the congressional hearings, and he was found guilty for that, and uh, did his time, got a presidential pardon sometime later. But um, he took, he fell on the, he fell on the sword for, for the, for the leader, the commander in chief, for, for Reagan, and so a good man. But uh, boy, he was a soldier, soldier. He looked every inch of the part, chest full of ribbons, and he just stood there toe to toe and didn't blink, and just took the beating. Good man. Anyway, he's going to head up the NRA. Good brand uh, representative, in my opinion, uh, going through it. NAFTA continues. Uh, pushing hard, trying to get it closed. Certainly Trump wants to see it closed. Um, we could read it all, what it's all about, but the essence, it comes down to simply this, that uh, America and uh, to some extent Canada are insisting that Mexico increase its minimum wage rate on automobile industry to $16 an hour. Mexico can't afford that. And that's what it's gonna come down to. So in a nutshell, that's the executive summary of what's going on right now and the time is ticking. Um, Mortgage rates increase at the big six. Keep in mind, these guys get the biggest profits uh, ever. There's, every year, they're doing m millions of dollars worth of profits. Um, right now, they just raised the, uh, the rates. Uh, the worst offender is TD Bank. They're up to 5.59% for a five-year mortgage. Um, best is the Bank of Montreal at 5.19, about a half a point lower. Is 5.19 is the Bank of Montreal. Uh, that's certainly going to slow down our GMP. Um, it's also going to raise that stress test even if you uh, have your 20% down and uh, don't require the CMHC uh, extra insurance, it's going to increase it. So it's going to slow down our economy at a time when uh, taxes and everything else are slowing down our housing and our economy. Japanese drug maker, uh, market entry strategy, the market for them in Japan is slowing down a little bit. So they're going to buy a Shire, a Hong Kong, a correction, a uh, British uh, a pharmaceutical firm for $80.5 billion. That's a lot of cash they're buying in there to gain access into Britain, um, which is interesting. Shell, yeah, this is another, these are these are canaries in the coal mine. These are, these are symptoms of a bigger problem. Shell is selling its stake in Canada's natural uh, resources. This is the oil sands, and uh, they have sold parts of it off before. They're now completely out and saying, that's it, we're gonna return, uh, take our capital back and go find other places that we make more money on the capital. And so that should be a should be a bellwether. Should be something going off for us. You have to remember, business is like water. And if the obstacles are there, it'll go around the water. If you put this red tape in place, it'll go around to jurisdictions, venues where the water, where the obstacles aren't. And that's what we're seeing happening here. Um, the uh, Sherwood Inn Motel in PEI 
Um, it's just been rated uh, 566 immigrants used the same address uh, to prove residencies and had their mail and they forwarded the mail along. And so it was a scam for immigration. And Canada's border, we're a soft target. Uh, we can walk across our border almost at any point. And uh, we have to do something, particularly now with our immigration stiffening, like we need to have a stiffened up. It's, it's getting concerning to most of us. Uh, Quebec Corps uh, buys uh, a media stake. And uh, this is, again, we've talked in our site about the two big. We have Bell and Rogers, 5G, and coming in, the, comp the competition's scarce, uh, fierce, and... Uh, uh, we have uh, small companies like Shaw and some other companies here mm -hmm. that uh, Rogers being very active in the field and doing mergers and acquisitions and taking it over. We're going to be con down to two or three companies left uh, with all that entails of a, a very tight monopoly uh, dictating prices of one thing or another. And the point we made in our class, I think, is that this is possibly like a utility. The, these, these services, they should be... Uh, to some extent controlled, I don't know to what, but there should be some advocate, somebody who speaks for us when prices are set that can be listened to, because if we don't, uh, only the rich will afford the best premium service, and the poor won't, won't have it, and so their kids won't get educated and have access to all this, this richness that uh, this new industrial age presents to us. Newspaper seeks non-profit status of the press in a very old, old 130-year-old uh, publication in Quebec, La Presse, um, just can't make it. It's facing the reality that uh, papers like this don't survive, and so they want non-profit status, and uh, they're trying to divest and take them away from Power Corporation, the Mara family, and uh, they run a lot of Quebec. They run uh, a number of things, and uh, they want to out from that and just set themselves up as a non-profit organization to see how much longer they can survive. E-commerce giants Shopify opens up its first physical location. Uh, this year, and that's like this little boutique. They're finding that the, the conventional retail stores don't work. Places like Canadian Tire, um, there's a whole bunch of things in there that you can just buy it online. There's, there's maybe a couple dozen items that you really want to go feel, touch, and look at and get a sense of. And the same for most businesses. And so we see the retail businesses are collapsing in the malls. As the, the gap is growing. The weakness is taking place in retail centers. But the, the, the retail stores still have something, and so Shopify has come up with this new business model saying, I'll tell you what, we'll put the umbrella group together, and you bring your 10 items in, you bring your 10 items in, in a little boutique site, we people come down and test and excitement and sense it all. And so uh, it may work, but we watch it. Uh, is it a new business model? Valiant changes its name and tries to move from its past. You recall Valiant uh, got tied up with... Uh, price gouging and things a while back and uh, fined heavily for it, et cetera, et cetera. And now they're trying to do a name change, a new name on the exchange, and just refresh their brand. And the Anderson Consulting Group, I remember, they were, uh, got tied up rightly or wrongly, and had to, the consulting branch had to spin off and come up with a new name. So you can, you can work on your brand, as I say, for, for so many years, and then it all goes away. Um, today we had the three citizens come back from, uh, from North Korea, and uh, well done. Well done on that with Trump and, uh, and the people from doing that, and well done to Kim Jong-un to at least show some signs of good faith. Uh, it's promising, and so we watch it that unfolds. And I was thinking, what, what can we offer? Because you can see, he's, he's, Kim Jong-un saying, look, we'll, we'll uh, take the nukes out up north, but any negotiator will say, if I do that for you, can you do this for me? And so what, you do this for me, what are they going to ask Trump to do? And, and the sense would be he'd say, get the 50,000 U.S. soldiers out of South Korea, take the threat down, bring it down for me. Um, Trump, I don't think, will do that, but not right away, certainly. Um, but what Trump could do, and Trump controls in large measure, is the IMF. And it occurs to me that he could go to the IMF for economic reasons and range budget price for giving loans to North Korea of good size to help rebuild, which would be a good thing, which would help rebuild North Korea and... and uh, get them back up so they can join the global economy. And so I watch for that. And as I think about the, the IMF and roles, I was struck by Argentina. Um, in 20 years, 17 years, it's been at both turn of the, the renewal that uh, they were a basket case. They went down. They lost about $100 billion to people who had loaned money on bonds and one thing or another. It was quite a fiasco. Uh, but now on different governments, they're coming back, again, back to the table and saying, we need help. We need finances. And the IMF are looking at uh, giving some funds to Argentina to help revitalize and get them back on side. Um, but the IMF comes in with a very closed mind about four things that give us your commanding heights, uh, privatize your power corporations, um, 
those sort of things, uh, raise your taxes, uh, raise your interest rates, uh, buy from home instead of buying abroad. And they've got the standard formula they apply, and it's very draconian, uh, to the point that the the, uh, the Asians have said, no thanks, we'll make our own. So the Asians have an equivalent IMF, not as well funded, but IMF fund driven by China because they want different rules. One size doesn't fit all for them. Anyway, enough on that, Colin Lakata. Um, the final thing I had was the... Um, in BC is the, the scrutiny of the NDP digital strategy. And it appears that the NDP um, put up uh, some apps and websites to try to solicit some information about the budget and what should be in the budget and how do you feel about the budget and what's your name and all the data and information. And uh, people responded and gave some input and the budget is getting ready to put together. But now it's coming out that they're going to take as the... Uh, as they did with the Cambridge folks, is uh, do some sifting of that and look around and see if they can target some good information in there. And that's causing the BC Liberals uh, some concern about the privacy and what was done. Uh, but it, it's interesting digital strategy. Let me do the thought here and I'm able to note to myself about it. Back to the blue strategy I talked about initially, the idea. And so here we have a situation that Trump, um, the digital communication strategy for political industry uh, presidents, etc., if you take that as the model, uh, certainly raise it. Um, he has raised the town hall meetings. He's raised the sum speeches. Um, you'll see him now as we ramp up to the 2018 to those venues that want him. He's going to be there with five and 10,000 people drawing crowds. That's never been done the, to the levels being done right now. Um, reduce. He's uh, reduced all the contacts with uh, with government. He doesn't go to the government meeting anymore and sit down, and uh, he doesn't go to the press dinners anymore. So he's reducing those. If you value that out on this, the value map, the, like the value proposition map, value proposition curve, um, he's eliminated. He's uh, done away with these sit down dinners. He's uh, um, credentials. He's talking today about. Uh, um, there was 91 percent, a survey has just been finished, 91 percent of the media coverage on the government media, um, 91 percent is negative to Trump. And so he's saying, why, let's have credentials that if you're going to publish fake news, uh, whether or not you believe it's fake news, then I think what we need is credentials, and maybe you're not going to sit in the front row of the press conferences anymore. And so he's eliminating uh, sit-downs with the TV and credentials. Um, he's added, he's put new points in the value proposition curve that weren't there to the extent they were right now, and things like Twitter and PR, this is how he communicates. He's got over 100 million people uh, uh, follow his Twitter, and rightfully so, because you can get advance notice of something happening like the Iranian deal. Uh, you can make some money on the stock market, so you want to plug into his, his site. But again, it's like the Telsa story that these new blue ocean strategies, you can't use the conventional models to validate. And the same thing here, that there's a sense of uncomfort with Telsa on, on this. But you can certainly take the blue ocean strategy and apply it to uh, the digital strategy there. Folks, I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you enjoyed our courses together. I, uh, we've all spent some time and energy on this thing. I really have enjoyed meeting you. Uh, we'll chat again uh, informally through the emails. But I really have enjoyed the class. Take care. Till next time. Bye-bye.